Welcome to the Your Music Industry Podcast. The podcast that gives you a direct route into the music industry's greatest minds. Your Music Industry is proudly brought to you by the Liverpool Audio Network with your host, Daniel Fisher-Jones. Welcome to the Your Music Industry Podcast. Whether this is your first time listening or you're one of our regularly engaged listeners, hello from me and the Liverpool Audio Network team. We've recently had a small little break from the podcast, which enabled us to make sure Link, the Electronic Sound Summer, was what we envisioned it to be. And it certainly was. The event was a huge success, so thank you if you were part of the story. So before I introduce our first guest of the show, I want to say an absolutely huge thank you to this episode's sponsor. By supporting this podcast, they're supporting your growth as an artist and as an individual. As a creative artist in the world of sound, you need the best tools for the job. Some of those tools will include the likes of VST synths and sound files, aka samples. Splice is the subscription platform for exactly that. With a vast array of over 1 million samples, they cater to every genre and creative spark. Each sample is thoroughly tagged, enabling you to smoothly explore their whole library. Having tags such as the key of the sample, you have the power to explore an array of samples that harmonically resonate with your track. With a filtered search in seconds, you can be finding inspiration and sample files that not only harmonically fit with the track, but are also of extreme high quality. Splice Sounds comes in the form of a monthly subscription, which, for only $7.99 a month, gives you access to this whole sound library. And on top of that, Splice have kindly offered every single listener of this podcast one free month. Use the code Liverpool Audio to obtain your free month or head over to splice.com slash Liverpool hyphen audio. Without further ado, it's time to introduce today's guest. I first came into contact with today's guest through a music production group on Facebook. This is well before the first Liverpool Audio Network event. Since then, he's been a regular speaker at our events while also developing a lot of content for the music production and DJ world. Rory's music industry journey is pretty insane, from a stint as head of promotions at Cream Ibiza to a marketing managing role at Defected Records and even releasing his own productions under a duo named Henry C. Social. Rory's got a wealth of insight to share in this episode. Now dedicating a lot of his time to make a transition, equipping DJs and producers with knowledge to help them reach their fans and goals, it's a pleasure to welcome you to today's guest, Rory Palmer Rowe. Welcome Rory to the Your Music Industry Podcast. Thanks a lot for coming along, I'm really excited. Thank you for having me, it's oh. been a wee while coming, I think yeah, since yeah. you first said that, well it was a while back wasn't it when you first kind of launched and you were like look we're doing this thing. Yeah, it was and September. I I, yeah, I stuck my hand up and I was like, look, I want to be involved, this sounds ace, let's do it, how can I be involved? And then it's been quite a nice kind of organic progression since then, since doing the first kind of talk mm. um, and then being here. Oh yeah, yeah, certainly. And yeah. it's interesting how the first talk at the first LAN event, it brought you and Paul together as well, which make your transition <laughs> will get mentioned later on. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, without labouring on it out the gates. But yeah, no, definitely it was... Um, it was funny how that was kind of the catalyst for a lot of things that have kind of happened since then. Mm -hmm. Certainly. So in this episode, I'd love to first kind of explore your journey as a marketer, as a creative, as a music entrepreneur, touching upon your Ibiza days with Cream, Defected Records, and then more recently, Mark, Mark, Market Music, make a transition. So let's start with Cream. How did that come into play working for Cream in Ibiza? Okay, so uh, since since I can really remember, I always wanted to be a DJ, and every year, so my birthday's in January, so every year, Christmas and birthday, I'd save up all my birthday money, and when you used to get like the Cadbury's chocolate bar with the 10 quid in from your auntie, mm. I'd save it all up, and my dream was I was going to buy decks and a mixer, yeah. and, <laughs> and every year, my mum would talk me out of it and be like, no, you're wasting your money, what do you want to do that for? And so I was reduced to like, borrowing my dad's Technics turntable, which was one of those ones where the lid actually closed because it was like fully automatic. Mm. And he'd scream at me because I'd be trying to like lift the lid up and try and like <laughs> scratch underneath. Um, and then I had like a really terrible sound lab mixer that I finally just ignored my mum and bought. Anyway, 
got to uni, first thing I did with my student loan was I went out and bought vinyl decks and a mixer. So after that first summer, I'd managed to convince my housemate to also do the same, and we were both DJing, we'd be putting parties on at uni. And where I went to uni, it was dead small, it was outside London, so you could, we could go to Fabric and kind of go out clubbing, but in terms of like a local night, there wasn't really anything, so everybody would throw house parties and have house parties with a proper like DJ booth set up, yeah. a proper system, and it was like... I remember texting my mate, being like, this is like something out of American Pie, because we've got the red cups, we've got a full sound system, it's going off, like the place was pumping. Um, so we started DJing, and we were like, right, what are we going to do this summer? Um, we should go away somewhere. And it was proper Kevin and Perry. It was like, well, we're DJs. Where do DJs go for the summer? <laughs> Let's go to Ibiza. So off we went. We booked one-way tickets, and we had a hotel booked, I think, for three days, and it was right at the start of the season, so there was, like, no one there. <laughs> And we traipsed around trying to find jobs. Um, and we went to every audition under the sun. If there was like a dancing audition for Lisa Lashes, if anyone's old enough to remember her. Um, I was there blagging it that I was like, oh yeah, I run my own nights and I dance at them and all this complete like made up bullshit, just trying to hustle and get by. Um, and doing like PR gigs outside bars in the West End just for like free drinks. And in fact, even, it's probably come down now, but the first paid job we had in Ibiza was putting up the signs outside the ship in, which we got paid for in beer. Um, <laughs> sweating away with the drill in the sunshine and a masonry bit. Um, and so the first year, it got down to the bit, like I'd spent all my money um, and it was time to kind of go home really. And then I bumped into a guy who was walking up the West End and he was like, look, um, how's it going? And I was like, oh, it's a bit shit. I'm going to have to go home. I've run out of money. And he was like, look, um, Manu Mission are looking for PRs. They've just fired the whole team. They're getting a new team together. Come down for the audition. I'll introduce you to the boss. Mm. So got introduced to the boss, managed to get the job. Uh, unfortunately, my mate didn't make it. I had to go home, but I managed to stay for the rest of the summer. Mm. Um, and during that time, like, Cream was massive on the island at that stage. So this was back in 2005. So trance was still a major thing. It was like Tiesto and Paul Van Dyke's alternate residence every week um, at Amnesia. Um, and I got to know the Cream guys really well because every Friday we used to have um, staff dinners um, in Bar M, which is now Ibiza Rocks Bar. And there used to be a Nando's in there. And Nando's crops up a lot in my, <laughs> in my general life. And um, I got to know the Cream guys really well. And it just seemed like a really easy ticket to sell. Like everybody on Thursday night was going to Cream. Mm. So the next year I was like messaging uh, the PR manager on, I think it was MySpace at that time. Throw it back there. Yeah, exactly. Um, being like, look, I'm coming back out to Ibiza. I really want to work uh, for you guys. You know, how can we make it happen? So I got the hook up there and I spent the next couple of years going back, working as a PR for them, doing, I think it was split shifts. No, it was better shifts than fur cream. So it was kind of like, I think we did a couple of like straight shifts on Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday was a split shift, and then Thursday was a split shift, and then we'd go to cream afterwards, and then we'd kind of stay out, and the rest that can't be said on the podcast. And, um, <laughs> and I did that, and eventually, like, with, with Ibiza, people tend to work in, like, three-year cycles, and I kind of realised that if you stayed there long enough, first of all, people would leave, and secondly, the majority of the people are out there were just out there to party and get fucked up however if you had a little inkling to have a bit of a work ethic and stay the course then it's quite easy to kind of jump up the ranks so that's what i did i stayed with it and um the pr manager left um and uh nick ferguson who went on to be one of the main bookers at cream and has only just recently left um he became operations manager and i came in underneath him um, and he must have thought like who's this guy but i kind of like clung on for grim death <laughs> and um yeah, we stayed at it, and um, that was kind of my first, I guess, experience into marketing was how to kind of fill up uh, a club night. And so Amnesia holds like, uh, I guess you can do probably about 6,000 people on turnaround over the course of the evening. Wow. Um, so being responsible for kind of filling that up every night. And this is also, this is before people used to buy all their tickets beforehand. Like I see a lot now when people come over, and I saw this change over the time. From the beginnings where people would come up and you'd speak to them in the street and be like, oh, or on the beach and be like, oh, what are you guys doing tonight? Where are you off to? And they'd be like, oh, I don't really know. I just kind of book tickets. And then towards the end, people were like, oh, yeah, I went on, um, you know, I'd be the spotlight, whatever. And I just booked my three tickets all in advance, got the best deal. And I'm just going to drink in the, you know, the hotel and the rest of the nights. And that's definitely kind of changed. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, you know, 
the internet's democratized it a little bit. As that kind of period went on and I got to learn more about, I guess, the music industry and booking artists, dealing with artists, listening to artists, um, complain a lot of the time, um, picking artists up from the airport, getting to know how to flatter people's egos, um, you know, picking people like Sasha up, getting mistaken for Calvin Harris once, getting mistaken oh, wow. for Maxwell once as well. I um, don't know how that <laughs> No, I don't know how that happened. I think I had long hair at the time, which if any of you know me now, I definitely don't have long hair now. Those days are long gone. Um, <laughs> but I had kind of long hair and was wearing kind of a cap and um, some guy was just leaning over the DJ booth and he was just like, dude, I love your music so much. And I was like, uh... Thanks. <laughs> and this went on for a bit, and then to the point I just cracked, and I was like, who, who do you think I am? And he's like, dude, you're Axwell, bro. And I was like, ah. <laughs> um, and then, like, yeah, doing balloons with Annie Mack, crouching behind the DJ booth. Uh, that was when she was with um, uh, Fidget House artist, whose name escapes me now. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also booting, booting Example off stage once. That was oh, wow. quite satisfying. Oh, that's... that's- that's a goal. <laughs> yeah, he was being super drunk and blessed him now. I think he's kind of really changed since he's kind of got married and stuff and turned over a bit of a new leaf, but mm. he was super drunk and helping himself to everyone else's rider. Um, and so I unceremoniously booted him off stage. <laughs> um, I also managed to almost knock uh, Eric Prids's laptop um, off the side in the dressing room, um, but I was still trying to open a bottle of beer. Yeah, um, I we bet did. that would have went down well. I know, right? <laughs> Uh, to be well, to be fair, it then got worse because he then went to thank the crowd at the end of his set, walked in front of a pyro, which then went off in his ass. <laughs> Ooh. I bet he'll remember that one. <laughs> I think so. I think he sent photos and he had like a bruise that literally went from like a, above his waistband down to just like above the knee uh, from where the scene had gone off. Um, so those were kind of like the Ibiza years and it came to the point where I met my wife And as we touched upon before, you can't kind of live out of a suitcase forever. Um, I'd been kind of doing bits of stuff for Cream back in the UK, doing kind of tour management and stuff like that. Um, But I was just like, you know what, I need to get serious now. I need to kind of provide a little bit. So I need a proper job. Um, Because I think the music industry is is really hard to break into. There's very few jobs going. And obviously everybody wants to be in it. Um, so I was looking and I was like, look, you know, I want to be in marketing. I think I know how to sell stuff to people and I like dance music, so I need something kind of around that, what's going on. Um, so at the time, I'd, I'd obviously done a fashion degree um, and I was looking for work in London. I was um, working in a snowboard shop down there at the time and I came across a brand called Million Hands um, and I got served a Facebook ad from them, I think it was the original thing I looked into them and they were a t-shirt company doing limited edition designs um, everything was kind of hand numbered and it had almost that limited edition vinyl feel to it yeah. but they're doing collaborations with at the time it was like Zombie Disco Squad um, I think who else at the time uh, Greco and that kind of like quite cool house European kind of vibe um, I think Tom was based in Berlin at, the mo- at that point um, and so I wrote them a really cringy letter um, basically just fanboying and being like, look, I did fashion design, I've worked for Cream, I love music, I love house music, we should totally meet. Um, and he was just like, okay, yeah, that sounds cool, let's go for coffee. So I was like, okay, well, we'll go for coffee and see what happens. And we met for coffee and he was like, look, you know, I think I think it sounds really cool, I think you could definitely help me out, um, you know, let's keep in touch. And I think this is one of the biggest kind of lessons I've learned. So I always used to think that if you emailed someone and they didn't reply, or they replied and then you emailed them again and the kind of the conversation went dead, was that I'd obviously piss them off or that, that I was spamming them or whatever. Um, but that's not the case. People are genuinely fucking busy, especially like, <laughs> especially as you know, right? But like doing what you do and kind of running your own business and stuff, you get so many emails and there's so many things that are like uh, draws on your time. And it's not that you don't want to speak to the person, it's just they're below 10 other things on your list. Yeah. And by the time you get to the end of the day, you're tired and you just want to go home and it just gets pushed pushed on. So I just kept kind of going and I was just like, okay, cool, well, you haven't got anything right now. When should we When should we catch up? When's a good time to ring you again? And Tom would be like, oh, okay, well, maybe next month I'll be in a better position with cash flow and stuff and I'll have just done this and that. And I just kept on and kept on. And um, he was like, okay, cool, like I'm... 
I'm in a position now, like, why don't you come in for one day a week? Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, so we kind of agreed a price. I kind of lowballed them, I think. <laughs> Which in hindsight was a little bit of an error, but it was cool. And I just wanted to get a kind of foot in the door, and it was money. And we mm. started off doing one day a week, and then for four days of the week, I was working the snowboard store, and then that went kind of well. And so for him, we started off doing email marketing, which I knew nothing about. Like, I knew how to arrange, like, PR teams and stuff and sell tickets, but I didn't know anything about email marketing. Um, but I did English at A-level, and I could string a sentence together. Um, so I was kind of like, okay, well, this, is, this makes sense. And plus, also, like, I knew, I knew the industry, and it's, it's a lot easier when you are your target audience. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think, like... You speak to a lot of people about marketing, especially with what we do. And nine times out of ten, if you're a DJ or a producer, you you are your audience. So it's like just look at yourself and think, well, where do I hang out? What are my motivations? What are my kind of triggers? So I was able to kind of write quite convincing copy, and Tom gave me a load of help and kind of we started doing more and more email marketing using MailChimp, which mm. was super easy to use. I started doing well, and we just gradually grew it and grew it. And I was doing more days to the point where I was able to then phase out the day job in the wow. snowball store. And I was full time at Million Hands. And um, that was amazing because Tom was, Tom was such a massive kind of influence in terms of marketing. And he, he was the first person I'd spoken to who really read, um, I guess, kind of like educational books, for want of a better word. Yeah, yeah. So he introduced me to like Tim Ferriss, uh, Seth Godin, like all these kind of people who are like, the kind of people that now looking back at them like, well, why didn't I read books by these people? But you don't necessarily know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that kind of really introduced me and kind of was a real tipping point for me um, and really getting into, like, I guess, the psychology behind marketing and why people actually buy stuff. The power of storytelling uh, as a way of connecting to your audience. Um, and so we were there for three or four years, I think we worked together, and we took million hands from... We ended up over doubling their email list on MailChimp. We went from like 15,000 people on Facebook to like 30 odd thousand. Um, and this was kind of almost, it was like kind of glory days of Facebook and Facebook advertising as well. It just kind of kicked in. Mm. So we were like running Facebook ads and testing it. We had like an account manager because we were spending like, I don't know, 500 odd quid a week or something. Um, so at that stage, two grand a month on Facebook, you got your own like little Facebook account manager. But it got to the point where they were like, they couldn't even answer the questions we were asking because we were just like, just hammering it and we were looking at Google Analytics and being like, okay, well, we've set up like UTM trackable links. Why is that saying six sales, whereas Facebook's saying 10 sales? And they were like, oh. Uh, they're like, well, have you tried this new ad? And we're like, I don't care about that. I just want to know. I just want to track my sales. Um, so that was that was an amazing kind of I guess baptism of fire and going from kind of the transition from kind of cream and having an interest in marketing very loosely into actual kind of like digital marketing. Mm. Um, and then as with all things, I kind of you know stuff changes. You kind of you kind of grow a little bit. I needed more kind of money and I'd kind of gone as far I think as I could with million hands. Yeah. Um, you kind of outgrow the company a little bit, um, and so I'd known. I'd known Simon Dunmore and Sam Devine from Ibiza, um, and they were doing pop-ups in uh, Box Park in London in Shoreditch, for any of you that know it. And we had a, a store there with Million Hands. So um, I think Sam had been into the shop, and then Simon came in, and we got chatting, and um, just about music in general and stuff. Um, and then my production partner, Will Hollyoaks, actually sent me a link saying, oh my God, defected looking for a social media executive or scheduler or something like that he was like dude you'd be perfect for this job you need to check it out so I did uh, applied and um, and yeah weirdly got an interview and I was like okay well I'm not sure if I even want to move necessarily like you get Million Hands was really like a family like I was so indebted to Tom anyway for everything that he taught me. Mm. Plus, like, there was such a tight group of us. It was family-run business. I looked after his kids. Like, so you kind of feel really bad, like you're almost like breaking up the band kind of <laughs> yeah. thing. Or like, you know, divorcing a wife or something. Um, so we were like, okay. Went to the interview at Defected. Um, and it seemed to go really well. Had a second interview uh, with the managing director there, uh, Dan Baxter at the time. Mm. Um, that went really well and I was kind of felt like I was almost kind of teaching them stuff or saying stuff that they didn't necessarily know um, and I was just like okay I feel like I've 
kind of done pretty well at this, we'll see. Um, and then I think it was that afternoon, like I'd popped in, had the second interview in the afternoon, gone home, and I was just leaving the house, I think I was on the way to the gym, and um, I got the phone call from their head of marketing at the time, uh, and he was just like, look, I just wanted to say you were um, far and away the strongest candidate we've had, and um, really impressed, and would like to offer you the job. And I was just like, my head fell off a little bit at that <laughs> point. Um, I was just like, oh my God, and it was like, it was a considerable jump up in money, like, Money had always been a problem with Million Hands because we'd been so lean, and it was definitely doing it for the love. Mm. But by that stage, uh, how long ago was that? It's getting on for a little bit now. Maybe three, four years ago now. So yeah, so I was, so I was in my thirties, just coming into my thirties, um, and obviously, like, you know, I know you shouldn't put ages on stuff, but there definitely comes a point where you start thinking, I should be making more money. I should be able to provide. Yeah. I should be able to do this. I mean. Me and my missus were still living at her mum's at the time. Um, I was married. In fact, yeah, definitely, I was married at that point. So married, still living with my mother-in-law. So that was the real kind of impetus, I guess, to make the jump. And it was just the next logical step, I think, in the career. And I guess that's when things got, I guess, really serious. Like, I, I knew certain things I knew a lot of, like how to sell stuff using social media. But I guess learning the intricacies of the music business and kind of who does what and the politics and how I guess um, how as a record label you can't be a record label anymore the mu- it's, it really is the music business and yeah. you need a 360 kind of approach to it now like the people that are surviving at the moment are people like Defected who put on events have festivals have record labels have artist management agencies um, do their own publishing it, you know, have streaming, the full package, yeah. And I think that's um, that's such a big lesson. And I think really to be successful, you need to kind of have a kind of an eye on that. Mm. And you know, you don't necessarily need to do it on like a global scale, like Defected. But you know, even if you look at people like uh, like a labels like Wolf Music, who are a bit more kind of niche in the kind of like housey disco kind of vibe. But still, they do their, they do the radio show, they DJ, they've got the label. The label, they'll never get the gigs that they get without the label. No offence, guys. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm sure they'll be the first people to see that, to say that. I mean, they've been invited over to do kind of Tim Sweeney's Beats in Space and things like that. Yeah. Um, and then also they were then doing merch through Million Hands. So you've, you've got to have that kind of like entrepreneurial business approach, I think, now. So, yeah, Defected was um, was great for kind of getting an understanding of what goes in uh, to the music business and also, I think, from what it takes to kind of sell a record. Like, I was kind of... I always thought that you just... If you made a really good record, then it would go on Beatport or Track Source and then it would get up the charts and then you'd have a number one and then you get bookings and it would work like that. And sorry to shatter any illusions, but... It, it doesn't <laughs> like so MK Storm Queen that had kind of just gone uh, to number one before I joined and so that had been out for 12 months before it actually started kind of bubbling away and they started working the record um, and they had to work that record and that's like a massive hit yeah like like huge and so that required constant posting of videos and this is Fun. This is like such a kind of, I guess, the tactic that we all take for granted nowadays is if you're trying to work a record, it's getting kind of video plays of it being played in a club or a festival, the crowd going nuts and then posting it up on social. But that was literally how they worked that record. It was MK playing it every gig. And the funny thing is, I guess certain people still don't kind of get that. And artists are still very reluctant when their social media manager or even like even at a grassroots level if they're doing it themselves when you get told if you're playing out take a phone better still get a mate if you've got a mate who does the driving for you or if you've got a mate that you've just given free guest list and access to your rider for the night most people have iPhones the new iPhones are incredible even in low even in low the iPhone X in low light is unreal just take video content it's really not hard um, because that's definitely what got Storm Queen there um and obviously then the other thing is obviously paid money like behind it again I thought it just all happened organically no no no, no, no. <laughs> yeah it, it just doesn't so looking at little things like waiting to see 
once your record gets into so say you've got a record out and obviously track source is a much softer chart than Beatport. It's, you require far less, far fewer sales mm. to kind of break into the track source chart. So waiting until you kind of get into kind of top 20, maybe top 10, and say that it's been out two weeks, you're just tickling into the top 10, then it's worth putting money behind it just to tip it over. Because then once you get in that top 10, you've then got the visibility on all the pages. And then you've probably got enough kind of, if it's good, you've then got enough momentum and it'll go in and chart. Same with like with iTunes. We were running pre-sale ad, pre-order ads on iTunes um, for as soon as the pre-order went live and then swapping it over swap, um, on the day of release and kind of pumping that just to try and get into the top 10 on iTunes in the dance chart mm. um, and then keeping pumping money to keep it there because, again, as soon as you drop out of that chart from the top 10 and go into that kind of second bit below the first click, then you're kind of dead. Yeah. Um, and then it's just not worth spending the money because you're not making enough. Um, so th little things like that were kind of super interesting and sitting across from Wes Saunders, who's now the director there, who at the time was one of their main kind of pluggers for radio and stuff and seeing, again, the other side of working a record, of actually getting it into kind of the right people's hands and getting radio plays and how that kind of works and how that's more about, I guess, traditional PR in terms of building relationships and stuff and knowing, you know, knowing when a record comes in and being like, okay, well, this is a Danny Howard record or being listening to it and going, well, this is like um, Cameo, mm. and knowing who to, based on that, knowing who to offer it to first, but also building that relationship so there's that kind of trust in the same way that when you used to go in a record store and, does anyone remember record stores? <laughs> but we bought, where we bought, <laughs> where we bought vinyl. Um, so yeah, well you go into a record store and you go there over time and you build up a relationship with the guy behind the counter and then you walk in and he gives you a pile and he's like, you're going to be banging to these and they're all boss. It's the same with being a radio plugger. You've got to build up that kind of level of trust so that when, you know, say you're a radio DJ, when Wes Saunders or whoever does it now approaches you, you pay attention because you know those tunes are going to be fire because he's taken the time to kind of respect, build the relationship and he's not just servicing you with everything that comes across his desk. Mm. So it's little things kind of like that. And I guess through... Over the two years there, the thing that was bubbling under for me was there's so many good artists out there who are terrible. So like we'd, you know, we'd do uh, a festival, like we are a festival or something where we'd have like a big lineup of people playing, maybe like yeah. 10 people on the bill. And so we'd try and coordinate it so that they would all launch and post their assets at the same time and put the buy link in, but we wanted them to put the buy link in the first comment because at the time Facebook was really penalizing links in the body of posts. And trying to do that was a nightmare. Like, just didn't have a clue. The artists were either too busy or just didn't understand it or just didn't care because they were proper old school. And so this was kind of triggering the thought of people need kind of help. Uh, and also, like, I've learned so much of the kind of, I guess, the subtleties of the marketing, but also like how to kind of take those marketing skills and apply them to the music industry, which is weird and wonderful. How are you finding this episode with Rory? Make sure to let us know online by using the hashtag your music industry and also tag us at Liverpool Audio. As always, this episode wouldn't be possible without Splice. So make sure you use code Liverpool Audio to gain your free month on the leading sample platform. Um, and like, how do you join those dots? So, so when I left Defected, because I was moving back up to Liverpool, moving back home um, to kind of start a family and buy a house, because we all know London houses are just ridiculous. Um, I was just like, okay, well, there's an opportunity here to kind of go out as a kind of uh, freelance, I guess, social media expert, which is a horrible phrase, um, <laughs> but to kind of use this and kind of, I guess, share my skills and really kind of help artists because it's, it shouldn't be that people with great social media teams get all the glory. Unfortunately, yeah. it is, but okay, how can we go? How can I help people kind of bridge that gap and realise their dreams a little bit more? Mm -hmm. um, and so I started doing that and it was great because I had the defected name behind me and I had those contacts so straight away I was able to pick up like Steve Lawler, uh, Perupa um, and then even like defected came back on as like a freelance client. <laughs> so that was, um, that was a really kind of great start. Um, and with that, that kind of gave me the leverage to kind of speak to other people and I guess it was another eye-opener as well 
it's one thing doing it for kind of defected and having that behind you. It's another thing doing it as a kind of just on your own. Mm-hmm. And I guess having to be um, not only a kind of social media manager, but also you being your own project manager, your own account manager, your own accountant, and like <laughs> <laughs> having to kind of wear all those different hats. Um, and at the same time, like I needed a day job um, because, you know, everyone needs to make that money yeah. uh, and I, I just didn't want to kind of scrape by on three clients and I had obviously other wife and other overheads so I got a job with um, PH Creative who are a marketing agency here in Liverpool and um, I guess that was the kind of I'm not going to say the final because I think you can always keep on learning but that was almost like the missing piece in terms of being a more rounded marketeer another horrible buzzword um, <laughs> But you know what I mean? Like it, that was kind of like suddenly it gone from defected who had kind of okay marketing budgets to now working with the likes of Apple or Vans or um, Barclays or RBS, or Vodafone. People have got like literally like thousands and thousands to spend on Facebook ads. Whereas like a defected, I'd maybe spent the most was maybe like five hundred quid. Yeah. <laughs> so suddenly being responsible for budgets like that was that kind of like the next kind of, I guess, layer uh, and understanding. And as an agency, we focus on, um, we're a persona-driven agency. So what that means is everything we do is based around understanding a persona, which is basically like your key audience. Mm-hmm. So as, um, as producers or DJs or record labels, you might have multiple personas who are like your kind of demographics. You might have the kind of the younger kids who come to the show come to the shows and party and kind of wear the floral shirts and the white socks pulled up but then you might have a slightly older demographic as well yeah. who maybe buy the vinyl and um, more likely to browse on band camp and get like if there's a kind of merch and vinyl limited release they buy that so it's really about kind of understanding the kind of the pain points and the the triggers for the different personas and then gearing your messaging to address those rather than just kind of being like well, what am I saying? What am I going out with? And being yeah. very kind of broadcasty, um, and that was definitely something that defected. That we'd had people come in and say this to us before, and we we tried to address it, but we didn't. Was that we were very kind of media broadcasty, um, and unfortunately now because there's so much kind of noise and stuff, you can't just be kind of shouting into the void and adding to this noise. Mm. You need to kind of cut through that, and I think in order to do that, you need to speak on a more personal level and have that understanding of what your audience wants and then kind of connect with them on that kind of level before you even start trying to sell to them. Yeah. Um, and I'd, I'd known some of this with a million hands, but this was the kind of really kind of connected all the dots for me now. Um, and yeah, and then that kind of brings us up to obviously met with you guys, yeah. uh, went kind of ranted a bit at one of your first kind of uh, meetups. <laughs> Um, about the things that kind of bugged me and tried to kind of pass on some of, I guess, these learnings I've picked up to mm-hmm. the guys there um, and kind of democratise marketing for, for people because what works for Jamie Jones isn't going to necessarily work for, for you and your, like, 500 fans. And it's a very different... It's so much easier going from, like, 10,000 to 20,000 than it is going from 1 to 100. Yeah. Um, and... And in many ways, there's also like even things like asking your mates to like your page. Whilst it gets you those numbers, in some ways, it's almost um, it's almost the worst thing you can do. And this is something that's only just come to me recently. So we'll digress onto this quickly. But so Facebook's algorithm is, and this is massively simplified, is kind of based on engagement. Yeah. So if you do it, if you post, and the same for Instagram, if you post it, it gets lots of engagement. They go, thumbs up, great, let's show this post to more people. Mm. What happens is, if you get your, you know, you do the shout out and be like, hey, I've just launched my artist profile, all my Facebook friends like it, the chances are most of your Facebook friends, some of them are obviously into what you do, but most of them, like your mum, isn't going to, she's probably going to like it, maybe, but she's not going to really care about it enough to continue to like it. Yeah. Again, with like, you know, if it's your, like I've started pages and my auntie likes it and my auntie doesn't like Jack in House. Like, so the problem is, you're adding all these people that aren't engaging and it's reducing your engagement rate. So suddenly Facebook's going, or Instagram's going, well, these posts aren't actually that engaging, so I'm not going to show them to anyone else. So, um, yeah, I know maybe in the past it would have been like, ask all your friends. Don't ask all your friends. <laughs> Be selective. <laughs> I actually seen the Make Your Transition post about that. Was it yesterday? Yes. The, the video yeah. all about kind of the 
change in engagement rates. I've never actually understood that before. I didn't realise it was kind of correspondent to the amount of followers in total and that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is... No one really knows exactly what how Facebook or Instagram's algorithm works, and it's based on so many variables. Um, and anyone who tells you otherwise is definitely lying, unless they work for Facebook. Mm-hmm. However, yeah, in the loosest possible sense, that's the best way of simplifying it. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, to your point, then with the video we did the other day, um, when you see people buying fake fans, it's and I'll, I'll clarify here: there's a difference between buying fake fans versus paying to serve adverts to people to grow your page Um, but yeah so if you kind of if you've got 100 people that follow your page and 10 people come in your post you've got an engagement rate of 10% that's great if you then double your fan base you're like wait I'm going to get booked now but the problem there is suddenly you've got 200 fans but 100 of them are never going to comment because they're like you know Romanian mothers (laughs) somewhere or whatever or not even fake accounts so suddenly you've halved your engagement rate because only 10 people are engaged out of 200 of your total following 5% engagement rate so straight away Facebook or Instagram starts downvoting your posts Um, so honestly it's the quickest way to kind of kill a social media account dead um, and you just see it kind of time and time again, people doing it. And you've only and people are getting wise now. Like, I think there was a time when promoters just looked at the numbers, yeah. whereas now everyone's a little bit more savvy, and people are actually starting to kind of look at posts. Um, and you know, I, it's great as well. So you know, on Facebook, on the left-hand column, if you go to someone's page, you've now got the info bit at the very bottom. And so you can actually see like when they've changed names of the page. Oh, wow. Um, Yeah, yeah, it'll show you the page history. So it'll show you initially what it's called and the data was named that. But then if you click more, it'll show you any iterations that have happened since the conception of the page. Mm. So it's kind of like it shattered it for people who've kind of done really clickbaity pages and then swapped it over or bought it from someone else and just changed the name and it was a meme page and now suddenly it's like, I don't know, DJ Bakshi, whatever. (laughs) Like... um, so yeah, it's becoming harder and harder to fake it and people are kind of getting onto it. Mm. But yeah, that was, um, that was definitely something, <laughs> something yeah, yeah. to take note so of. So I think it'd be good to kind of talk specifically about different social medias now. So maybe if we begin with Facebook, as previously mentioned, what are ways, what are, what are approaches people can take to basically make sure not only their fans are seeing the content, but also to get new fans? Okay, so I think as we, as a kind of precursor to jumping into kind of channels, it's worth saying that you need to make sure your content is native for whatever channel is on. Um, And again, you see people and they'll share their Instagram posts automatically to Facebook. And this is a great example of kind of what not to do. Um, So by being native, I mean the post needs to fit within the kind of ecosystem and being like naturally there and be the kind of the most appropriate type of content for um for that platform yeah um and so that way it's not kind of jarring it's just fitting in kind of seamlessly um and then the flip side of that is if the content's right it's also understanding the motivations behind why people are on that channel in the first place so generally speaking like if you think back to the last time you used facebook or what you're doing like for me um, so I didn't have a lot of work time tabled in for the rest of the day. So I was literally killing time. Um, and chances are you're probably on your mobile as well. Um, so that's the exact reason why if you then post up a SoundCloud link saying, come and listen to my four-hour mix and wonder why it gets no engagement. Well, if I'm on my mobile phone at the bus stop, I'm not going to listen to a four-hour mix, yeah. no matter how good it is. <laughs> so this is what I mean by kind of being native in the same way that if on Instagram uh, and this kills me is when people post up uh, pictures of like flyer artwork and be like hey come to my show because generally the motivations for people being on Instagram is it's pretty pictures or their video has kind of cropped in a, mm. c- kind of crept in a little bit so why you think posting up a, you know, a horribly like clip art design flyer is going to gather likes I don't know but people do it so I think first of all we're dealing with Facebook okay why are people on there generally it's to be entertained give or take, killing time, okay, what is native content for it? What's kind of performing well? Mm. And as we've seen over the past few years, video has just become massive on Facebook. Um, It's kind of one of the reasons why um, images have dropped a little bit and people generally don't post just, you know, when you could just post text. 
before they did the thing where they make it into a picture and that was just kind of getting lost because people were doing loads of video and it was just losing it. So I think with Facebook, what you want to do is first of all, think about being native, so that generally means video. Um, although recently I've been having loads of success um, by creating little images using an app called Canva, uh, which is dead good, you get it on your phone and it's kind of like Photoshop for idiots. <laughs> I like to think that I can kind of do Photoshop and creative things with my uh, degree, but compared to some of the designers I work with, I definitely can't. So Canva is amazing because it allows you to quickly do it on your phone and they've got loads of presets and stuff and you can create quite professional looking stuff. Mm. So we talked about like getting to kind of know your personas and stuff. So creating like question images, almost like kind of memes but without the image being like, you know, what was the first record you ever bought, that sort of thing. And you can kind of brand it up a little bit. They work really, really well as well. But to answer your question about to kind of, I guess, to grow on Facebook, uh, especially for, I guess, for free-ish, as organically as possible, um, the tactic that I use for most of my clients is, so for every piece of self-promotional content, i.e. buy my track, listen to my mix, do something that I want you to do, you want to be posting two bits of content that are kind of third-party or greater good posts. So by that I mean something that's purely there to kind of entertain or provide value to your fans. Mm. Um, it's not asking them to really to do anything other than just to kind of engage and watch it. Um, so what works really well with that is if you get a video... Uh, like a viral video or a funny video um, and this is all dependent on your like niche right yeah, yeah. so <laughs> so like I don't know let's say you're I don't know if you're a dub techno artist you're probably not going to go like all lad bible on it but you might find something where it's like I don't know I saw a video the other day and it was a massive and by massive I mean like 12 foot by 6 foot replica of a 909 drum machine oh, yeah, that actually there's someone who wired up and actually worked and people could play it so that would be a great example of a third party video that's completely on brand with what you do that you could share on Facebook and the great thing about these posts is they will always do way better than your more kind of salesy posts um because it's just human nature, right? And for their very good nature, it's video, it's not salesy, it's kind of viral, there's a good chance it's going to get a lot of likes and get a lot better distribution. So what that does is that gets your page in front of more, you know, you can reach outside of the box and gets you in front of new fans because yeah. you've got to get in front of new people that haven't heard of you in order for people to like you. If only your fans see it, and you're never going to grow. Um, and then the biggest tip around that, um, and this was something I only found out about when I started at PH Creative, was if you have less than 60,000 fans, I think it is on Facebook, um, if someone engages with the post and you get all your kind of numbers like 12 likes or 15 likes or, you know, 1,000 likes maybe, if you click on that number, it then lists out in a little drop-down menu of all the people that have liked it and there's a little box next to all their names that say invite um, and you can scroll down that and invite them and they're going to get a notification saying, hey, come and like this page um, and it's a you know, not everybody does accept it. But generally, if you do it kind of, if you keep on it and do it like within 24 hours of posting and just keep going back to it, generally speaking, if someone's engaged with a post and then they get an uh, a notification saying, hey, you engaged with this post, why didn't you like the page? A lot of people do. So it's a really great tip for anyone trying to grow a page organically. Um, that would be my kind of first go-to. And that's what we used for, that was the main thing we used for Acid 87. Little plug there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's for you, Adam. Um, <laughs> that, uh, that, that's how we, we took their page from, uh, they were at like 6,000, and I think we've just tickled the 15 or 16K mark. Um, and, you know, not every post will go viral, um, but we've had a couple of three, I guess, in the 12 months we've been working on it, maybe, that have just kind of gone nuts. You know, some of the posts, like, bomb completely and you think it'll be a great video it doesn't but you will get and trust me this is it's all about kind of um just keeping on keeping on you will get that one kind of post that does mm. and then you can add you know we added we've got a post that's gone viral at the moment and we've been adding like a thousand a week organic um so it just kind of goes to show and like that's that's such a massive lesson throughout i guess my whole kind of career is just keep on going yeah keep going because more than the next person because if you can just outlast them and hang on that little bit longer, then you've got it. And then it's just a war of attrition, just being really stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> so say someone's got a release coming out, maybe they're doing the release DIY as well, and they've got, say, a £30 budget for Facebook. Yeah. What would you recommend they could use that for that would be more okay. beneficial or could have a higher ROI than... Yeah, yeah. so if you've got... Um, 
if you've got limited budget, like if you're doing it yourself and you just want to kind of do, get the best possible results on a shoestring, mm. what I would look at doing is um, doing what I call like a dub video, which is what I do for some of my clients. And it's find like a funny viral video where someone's dancing. And then um, if you've got a release coming out, chances are you've got some basic editing skills. So it's really easy. Like you can actually do this in Ableton, I discovered. Um, or even iMovie will do it. But basically beat match by the track to the that to the whatever actions going on in the video. Mm. Um, and then you can just share this and then you can put some money behind it. So first of all, I would say create your video. Yeah. Don't brand it up. Like find something that's like, you know, go on like... I don't know, this is where something like Unilad would be relevant because they're obviously creating some of the most shareable stuff. But generally, mm -hmm. you see a video in your feed, you've been showing it because it's been popular. Yeah. So grab that, make sure it fits with your kind of brand and the sort of music you're making. Dub it with your track at the kind of key point, and then I'd post it up. Um, in the body of the post, I wouldn't say, hey, this is my new track because it's a bit, a bit overtly salesy. What you want is for people to kind of see the video, appreciate it for what it is and appreciate being entertained and then go, oh, hang on, that track's banging in the background, what's that? So that's where you put either your pre-order beat port or track source link in the first comment mm -hmm. and just say track ID, whatever, check it out here. Um, and I'd always use check it out rather than buy because again, it's still commanding people, it's still a strong call to action, but it's just a little bit less committed. Like if someone says to me, oh, do you fancy checking this out? I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I've got nothing to lose. Whereas, like, hey, buy this straight away. It's like, well, no, I'm not going to buy it. So, post it up, put the buy link in the first comment, have a call to action, but don't be too salesy. Um, and then wait 24 hours for it to get as much kind of organic reach as possible. Because if you spend from the start, Facebook's just going to pick the lowest hanging fruit and steal your budget for that. So, kind of get as much organic as possible and then put your spend on it. Um, and in terms of kind of targeting, it depends. I mean, if you've got a big enough following of fans, then obviously you want to start with your fans first and kind of build out. So start with the people that are closest to you and furthest down, I guess, the sales funnel, and then kind of slowly build out. Um, if you don't, then it becomes a little bit harder. You've then got to think, well, are there any artists out there who do have, who are kind of similar to me, or maybe you speak to the label and see if you can get um, advertiser rights on their Facebook page if they've got a much bigger page, and then you can kind of pay to reach them. But obviously they might be doing their own. So what you don't want to do is be bidding on the same audience because then you're just going to like drive each other's bids up. So I think okay. that's probably the kind of the quickest way to do it on a shoestring and actually do stuff that's effective. And would you say labels are typically open to that sort of thing? I think so, yeah. Generally, it's more artists that get funny about it because they kind of go, oh, well, are you cheapening my music by putting it on this sort of video? Mm. Um, but, I mean, there's again, it comes back to this, why are you on Facebook in the first place? If you're there to be entertained, then a pack shot with some audio behind it is dull as fucking dishwater. Yeah. There's nothing entertaining about that. I mean... The other kind of side of the coin is if you don't, if you want to be more serious and like, I don't know, dubbing your latest release to a bear scratching its back on a tree isn't kind of on brand for you, then you can be kind of cooler about it. And if you're either getting big artist plays, if you've been lucky enough and you can find a video of them, then do that. Or, you know, if you're at a level where you're playing, playing gigs where there's a few people there and your record's going off then it comes back to that thing of having your mate behind you with a camera mm. um, and capturing that. Um, I mean, you've got it. So the story it defected of um, Lee Walker, Freak Like Me, the DJ Dion bootleg, that all came about because of that one video from Music On Closing where uh, Marco Carolla played it and it had got like a million views or something on Facebook within like a day and stuff. And we were just like, holy shit, we have to sign this record. Um, and we dined out on that as well, like the main kind of marketing thing, like that that one video did most of the marketing for it. Um, later, when it then got resung and stuff, and we partnered with Ministry to put it out, and then there was a bit more of a kind of, a, I guess, a campaign behind it. But in terms of like grassroots, like getting a big artist play, and just a, you want to see a crowd going off to a track and feel that thing of, oh my God, and get those goosebumps and think, oh my God, I wish I was in the crowd. Yeah. I wish I was there. And it's that kind of emotion that you need to connect. And you're never going to get that emotion or the same level of emotion with, you know, a pack shot and the audio playing. Like save that for, you know, when you're three weeks into the release and you just want to kind of like give it a little nudge or something and mention it again. So on that note of kind of 
giving it a nudge and waiting time, what's a strategy someone could play? Because obviously it's all well and good having the budget, having a plan of wanting to get sales, but without a strategy, you could just throw 30 quid on one post and it's gone forever then. What? Yeah, I, th- I think in terms of strategy, it comes down more to release strategy. Mm. Like, you kind of, your record's either going to, Okay, so <laughs> Simon Dunmore famously said to me, in this industry, every now and again, you have to kill your children. Um, he wasn't talking about his literal children, by the way. They're all still alive and very well. Um, what he meant was that no matter how much you love a record, if it doesn't take, there's no point throwing more money at it. It's just going to be money wasted and move on to the next record. Um, and unfortunately, as the industry's progressed, that turnaround's become quicker and quicker. Um, and records literally get worked for maybe two, three weeks and then kind of go. Um, so with that in mind, I think, you know, give it that blip of money, spend that 30 quid, but then if, it, if it's not charting, then, then give up and get back in the studio. Because yeah. at the end of the day, like, there's nothing... If we're looking at how can I market myself to kind of reach that end goal, which I'm guessing for most people is, you know getting booked, either getting signed to massive labels or getting booked on big tours, no amount of marketing will get you there quicker than having a release, like a massive release. Like, look at the Camel Fat Lads, for instance. Like, one track can make your career. Yeah. Like, it, you know, and obviously I'm not taking away anything from those boys. Like, they're music-making machines um, and they have such a pedigree and I'm not going to kind of out them in terms of, like, all the other acts they've been before then. But, like... You know, they've written tracks for like Kylie and shit like that. Mm, Neo. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Like they've had proper chart success before that ever came along. Um, But like that's a record like that will put a thousand fans, one will put hundreds of thousands of fans on your Instagram account. It will kind of, you know, it will do all that. So I think it always comes down to yes, spend your 30 quid. And, you know, there's even people that, We'll have a release and they'll pay their mates to buy the record buy the pre-order just so it gets a little bit of a mm. kind of boost beforehand um but don't ever kind of get it get it twisted and think that you know you're somehow going to manufacture a glory out of nothing yeah. um you know be, get in the studio first and kind of hone your craft there and then this is all just kind of icing on the cake mm. so i think we've spoken a lot about facebook yeah. Maybe we could talk more about Instagram now, with especially with stories, and maybe touching upon Instagram TV as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think it's it's how it all fits together. I think because mm. you're going to have fans that are on different channels, but it's recognizing what the different channels kind of do yeah. in terms of your kind of your marketing funnel. Um, marketing funnels are. I've been around for ages in traditional marketing, but I don't think Defected had heard of a marketing funnel whilst I was there. Um, I was maybe loosely aware of it a million hands, but never made the kind of connection. So a marketing funnel is someone comes in at the top of a funnel, so it's an upside down triangle, get loads of people at the top, they gradually move down, people drop out the sides at different stages. Um, so it's more like a marketing colander, let's say. <laughs> um, and then eventually at the bottom of it, it's hopefully where people are like, um, interact with you in some ways and so normally let's say like buy a record or become like a super fan so these are people that buy your records and go to your gigs so at the top of it you want to just kind of get in front of people uh, so for that that's where things like YouTube um, where streaming so like Spotify and SoundCloud are amazing because it's just massive reach it's free so people can just hear your music there's no kind of obligation to buy or anything like that so that's kind of what those channels do for you The next stage, once people have kind of heard of you, do you then come into the consideration phase? And in terms of what we do in our industry, it's about kind of brand building and really kind of making that emotional connection. Um, And because the goal is we want super fans. If you've got a thousand true fans, then you can survive as an artist. So this is... This is where things like Instagram and Facebook come in. They sit at this level, where it's like storytelling. Um, This is why people like Salado do really, really well. Or even if we want to be a little bit cooler, like your Ida Embergs and people like that, and like your drum code guys are a bit better. It's that kind of storytelling and opening up a little bit to your fans and giving them a glimpse into what it's like to be on tour or the behind the scenes. And then kind of from that, you're then kind of building onto like email lists and stuff down the bottom. So Facebook and Instagram are very much about that kind of storytelling and letting people in and giving them an insight into who you are as an artist and what makes you tick. 
Um, and so with Instagram, Instagram is amazing for that, particularly with the story features, because it allows you to to give them that insight. Um, and then you get people going, well, oh, I don't know what to post. Like, what do I do? I'm not that exciting. The great thing is, this, first of all, especially in Britain, everyone loves an underdog. Like, we've made a <laughs> whole thing out of that. So I think you don't have to be the finished article on Instagram, especially with Instagram stories. You can just kind of document rather than creating. And this is something that you'll hear time and time again me say. Um, we talk about it a lot on the Market Music course. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, what this is essentially doing is just document your day-to-day, the process of making kind of music. Um, and the Instagram stories are great because they allow you to do this in a really throwaway kind of manner. It doesn't have to be polished. It can be quite fun. You don't have to be a kind of comedian, although if you find you do like, you know, like Fisher's smashing at the moment using Instagram because he's a gobby Australian. And a lot of people <laughs> love that. And, you know, fuck me, it's, it's entertaining whatever you think of the guy. It is massively entertaining. So... Use Instagram stories to kind of do the documentation and then you can use your kind of grid as your more kind of traditional, kind of the best bits almost, like a kind of curation. Mm. Um, And I guess how to kind of put that into like a real world kind of uh, usage is like, let's say you are playing a gig and the promoter wants you to promote it and they're like, oh, well, maybe you could do a mix of my SoundCloud. Like, how do you put that all to kind of together from like that initial kind of pre-promotion of the gig through to you playing the gig? You might start off, so you go, okay, right, I've got to do this mix. So you might do a little Instagram story of you record shopping, flicking through vinyl. It could be like a boomerang in your story, um, which would animate, which would be quite cool. Um, You then might like take when you get home you could then lay all the records out nicely and you could then do um just an instagram grid post a nice kind of arty shot of the records then when you like recording the mix you might as well live stream it um on facebook or you could do it straight to instagram streaming so you've got that you can then chop bits of that up and that could maybe the full thing could go on youtube and you might use you know, the first 30 minutes of it will go on Facebook and then the full audio can go on SoundCloud. So suddenly you're creating loads of bits of content just through doing kind of one thing. Yeah, yeah. And then when you're on your way to the gig, then that's when you should be kind of taking, you know, <laughs> it's the classic DJ shot that everyone jokes about the waiting in the airport with the feet up on the record bag. But, you know, that's kind of what people want to see and people want to see what goes on behind the kind of the closed doors. People want to see the green room where your rider is. You know, if there's other DJs there, you can kind of have a conversation with them, just grab it on your Instagram story. Um, It can then be like back in the hotel room, like after the gig. It could be like, you know, moments during the gig that you can then capture. You stick, get one of those gorilla pods, which are amazing tripods that will grip onto anything. No plug there. Um, (laughs) I just have one in its boss and you can fit fit a phone on it or you can even put a GoPro or whatever and you just kind of capture that. You might live stream some of it. But you're not actually creating anything specific other than just doing what you do, which is making music or playing records. Mm. You're just documenting the process. And what we as humans find really fascinating is watching that underdog story and rooting for them and hoping that they do get there. And you're obviously, you're going to get haters, but there's something fascinating in watching someone grow and watching their progression and rooting for them. And I think that's why documenting rather than creating is so powerful. Um, And, you know, okay, if you're not playing gigs every week, then there's still other things you can do. You're still hustling, you're still trying to, there's still a process you're doing to get to that point where you're playing gigs. So document that. And that's, yeah, Instagram stories is just made for that. Like, Absolutely. And then obviously, like, for, if you've done, like, a gig and you've got, like, a load of stories, then making a moment and having it as that kind of highlight reel is fantastic. Um, Instagram stories as well, from a promotions point of view, I've had loads of people saying that, because you can do sponsored stories now, that they're getting loads of um, loads of cheap clicks and stuff like that. Personally, I tested it the other week and I didn't find it was the case. But... I don't know. I think with golden rule with marketing is like listen, but try everything for yourself, yeah. and then make your own judgments on it, yeah. right? So, what is Instagram TV, and how can someone in the music industry use it? I don't know. At the moment, for me, it feels like a bit of a distraction for mm. most people. I think if you're uh, if you're at a label stage where you can kind of do long form stuff, 
then sound. And you've probably, you're creating that kind of content. But I think it kind of comes back to what we said about before is that when you're, if you're kind of in entrepreneurial mode or you're in a startup or you've only got a certain number of hours in the day, um, especially when you should be making music. Um, so I think focus on doing the kind of basics right. And then once you're doing that and you feel like you've got free time, and you suddenly want to create your own kind of day in the life documentary and you want to put that up on Instagram TV, then kind of go for it. But I think it would, I think it would be the wrong advice to kind of steer people towards something like that, which when they're probably not doing the basics right. Okay. Yeah. Solid, that's solid advice. That's what I like. It's, it's honest, it's clear, it's free. No, it's, it's so easy to get all the kind of shiny, sparkly things. It's so easy to kind of get like distracted by them and thinking you're going to have the silver bullet that's suddenly going to kind of achieve all your dreams for you. But the reality of it is it's, it's not. It's about kind of persistent effort and being consistent over time and you'll just kind of reach that tipping point. Um, I mean, like, I was watching something with Gary Vee the other day and he was saying with his wine thing, he'd done, like, it's like over 200 videos before he even started getting, like, engagement or anything. Um, and, like, if you think you're starting a YouTube channel, that's the harsh reality of it now. Yeah. Like, if you start a YouTube channel now, no one's going to give a fuck for, like, at least your first 100 videos. <laughs> but there will come a tipping point and you might get that one video that kind of goes viral. But you've just got to have the tenacity to kind of stick it out and trust in the kind of the process and just kind of grind away at it because everyone else who starts their channel and gives up after 10 videos, yeah. you've just got to be doing it longer than the next person, right? Yeah. So, and it's, you know, it's the same reason why, well, it's one of the reasons Defected are in the game still, you know, they're the longest running independent electronic music label. Um, oh, wow. I yeah. That. Like they've kind of weathered it and it's just from making sure doing the basics right just p releasing quality music that has appeal but doesn't necessarily chase trends and I think that's kind of quite a good business lesson awesome so maybe it'd be nice to talk about something less marketing and more lifestyle based so obviously yeah. you mentioned um, when you got the job for Defected you were just about to go to the gym so yeah. what, what do you do to stay healthy and stay fit and stay kind of in the zone <laughs> well? um, I think that's massively important I think if you look at um, if you read anyone, like any big achievers, biographies or autobiographies, one of the massive trends is not only is it getting up early, but um, it's always generally these people will, like have some, some form of exercise first thing in the morning. Mm. Um, and that's something that I've definitely, I've adopted. Like sometimes it's not always first thing in the morning, but um, exercise is a massive part of staying healthy and it really sits, staying healthy sits at odds with kind of the industry we're in, massively so. Um, I mean, Christ, you've only got to look, <laughs> do some Facebook digging, you'll see photos of me and Ibiza looking stick thin, um, uh, like ill. Um, but it's, you know, it's, you can't, it's not sustainable. And if we're talking about being persistent and outla outlasting the next person, then you start having to look at living a more sustainable lifestyle. Um, and I'm a big believer that if you've kind of like exercise has this amazing function on the mind of just kind of clearing it, it's a real kind of release. Even if it's a case of I find if I get stuck in the studio working on something, going for like a 10 minute walk around the block normally kind of like clears things up a little bit. Um, so in terms of like morning, like I've got routines and I think Paul's just written a blog, uh, Paul Nolan has just written a blog post on like routines yeah, exactly. and rituals. But my rituals currently, and this kind of changes, but like, I get up early, so I get up about half five in the morning. This is mainly to feed my cats, but I like that kind of golden <laughs> hour that you get before anyone else gets up for just yeah. kind of before you have emails, before you have worries, before you even look on social media, because social media is a killer for creativity, is to just have that time to kind of think. So I get up, I have coffee, um, I generally have some form of protein straight away. I'll drink the coffee, I'll think. Um, I then have this amazing kind of um, journal called a Best Self company journal which aren't cheap but again I'd recommend them um, and I do my kind of uh, gratitude for the day so just thinking about like things that you're kind of grateful for and put you in that positive mindset um, so it's quite easy like there's just three that you generally do and you find yourself being grateful for the same things every day but Tony Robbins um, the kind of life coach he swears by splitting it out into three kind of categories. And I've started doing that and I found that definitely works. So those are someone that you've been thankful for 
and who has maybe helped your career or helped you as a person. Mm. Give gratitude to them and think about that. An inanimate object. So sometimes it could just be the fact that I'm blessed enough to be sitting here in my house, or it could be the fact that, you know, we don't live in a third world country and I've been able to abuse the kettle to make, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to make the coffee I'm drinking. Um, you can get quite kind of basic with those, but that's quite nice in a way. Um, and then finally, an opportunity that you've got coming up that day. So it might be the fact that you're going to be in the studio later and you get to work on your kind of music, or it might just even the fact that you get to make music at, at all. Mm. So I do my kind of gratitude. Um, and then I kind of plan out my kind of goals for the day and make my kind of list of what I need to kind of achieve. Um, and then the other thing is kind of I also am religious about making my bed. Um, yes. So just so you, because sometimes the day is going to get away from you and all hell is going to break loose. And you might have five hours in the studio booked, but the car breaks down, or you've got to pick up the missus, or whatever happens. But if you can get that small win, which you have kind of complete control over at the beginning of the day, I think it just puts you in that kind of positive mindset. Um, and then either try and go to the gym or even just busting out like five or ten press-ups just to kind of go from being kind of a sleeping state where you're just purely cerebral trying to get into the kind of physical state it just kind of connects that mind yeah. with the body um, and then recently I've got into at the end of the shower smashing it onto the cold for the yeah, last 30 yeah, seconds that's good um, which if, if anyone says they're not a morning person, try this, and it, <laughs> <laughs> it definitely makes you a morning person. Yeah, you'll be doing with Hoff too. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny though, because you see it increasingly, like, obviously, uh, Paul Nolan's massively into this, like, he does a lot of meditation, a lot of yoga, and swears by it. Also does uh, jiu-jitsu, I think. Yeah, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Yeah, so, like, that kind of physical thing is a real big thing for him. Um, and you're starting to see it a lot more. Like, just when I left Cream, like, that was the the turning point where you started seeing like artists suddenly just drinking water um Calvin Harris was just about to do his whichever was it Gucci or Hoopty or whoever it was was just about to do that advert so he was on like full meal prep kind of thing <laughs> but kind of gone are those days of like your um your Alex P's and Brandon Blocks you know doing like gram lines off the record as it spins around like you're seeing that real kind of shift and I think it's important because like Mental health is a big thing. We've seen it with Bengu, we've seen it with Scream. Loads of people are coming out now and being like, look, you know, it takes its toll. Um, being on the road, especially, like, I've just got back from the States and I was there for two weeks and, like, it's kind of lonely on your own. Like, eating on your own is really lonely. Like, you go to a bar and you're like, ah, oh, just have a couple of drinks and that feels a bit weird. And you go home and particularly with the time difference, like, all your nearest and dearest are at home asleep, so you can't call anyone. And you're literally just sitting there being like... Do, do, do. like what do I do and it, you do go a little bit crazy so throw in sleep depri de uh, deprivation substance abuse even alcohol like whatever and you've got a recipe for disaster and I think that's why if you don't take care of yourself you, you'll just burn out really mm -hmm. quickly and we've seen that and I think it's amazing that we are we are a lot more aware of it and people are speaking out on it mm. so before my final question I've got one that it could be on a local scale, it could be on an international scale, and let's say a time frame of about three years. Mm. So what change would you like to see in the music industry over the next, over that course of time, really? Oh, good question. Um, I don't know, I've, it's a tricky one. I think we're at a weird crossroads where I think social, we were realising the kind of perils of social media, but unfortunately we're becoming increasingly kind of reliant on it and marketing. And I'm being massively hypocritical and contradictory saying this, but like, I personally hate social media. And if it wasn't my business, would have nothing to do with it. However, I know this is like, obviously we've just talked about marketing for the past however long. <laughs> yeah. Social media's played a massive part in it. So it's, I guess it's... <sighs> You've kind of, you've kind of got to be involved in it. Unfortunately, it's kind of a necessary evil. But I think, I think I'd like to see, uh, I guess, a, an aware, a greater awareness of what's real and what's not. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's kind of what I'm part of. What I'm trying to do with Paul Nolan is, is that is to kind of educate people and make people aware of what actually goes in behind the scenes to, you know 
being successful as an artist and it's not just a case of you know stuff just doesn't magically happen and just because you don't have all those followers overnight and so and so has paid for a load of followers and suddenly seems to have that you know that's not because you're doing something wrong or it's not because they're any better than you it's just trying to peel that kind of curtain back a little bit and I think that will go some way to alleviating a lot of the kind of mental issues and the pressures that people are facing on social media and I try and undo some of the damage that it's kind of causing. Mm. Um, so I'd like to kind of see that kind of like awakening, I guess, in terms of the music industry. Yeah. Um, and I would love for people just to kind of help each other a little bit more. I think the music, since the Cream days, like, and promoters especially, I think are the number one offenders for this. And we, you know, we've seen it time and time again in Liverpool of promoters doing the worst things to each other, trying to like ruin other people's businesses and stuff. Um, and I think there's room in this industry for everybody. Um, I think if you're making truly unique music, there's room for everyone. And therefore there's no reason why we shouldn't help each other more. Um, I think it's far more powerful to do that than to try and kind of cut people down and yeah. try and like raise yourself up by pushing other people down. So I think if we could kind of like, as a kind of collective, get into that mindset a little bit more um, and look after each other a little bit more, I think the music industry would be in a much better place. Mm. But I mean, I think it's going that way. It feels yeah. like there is a bit of a shift there. So I'm definitely kind of, despite my old man grumblings <laughs> on social, I, I'm still quite positive. That's good. Well, it's really good to see Apple starting to implement things on the social media side of things, so you become more aware of what you're using and the times, and you can, I believe you can also set time limits, can you? Or yeah, definitely. Uh, what else is doing that? So uh, the new kind of Google AI stuff also does that, gives mm. you like screen time, kind of readouts, and uh, Instagram started to do it as well, I think. That's been rolled out. Um, I think just being more aware, because it's like... So I've... I temporarily deleted my Facebook app on my phone. Um, I kept the pages app because obviously my clients, <laughs> I needed it in that respect. But I think um, in terms of if you're, if you're a producer or a DJ, um, I think the more time you can spend off it, you serve it, especially try, try it. Because you, you can delete the app off your phone and your account stays and everything's fine. But it just means that if you're going to go on it, you need to actively be like, okay, I'm going to dedicate to some time and go onto my laptop and navigate to Facebook and you'd be massively surprised how you don't miss it and you'd also be massively surprised how much free time you have and what can you do with that free time? You can make music. And as we all know, music, having that hit record is the one thing that will do more for your socials and your marketing than any magic that I could sprinkle on it. So yeah, try it. Let Dan and the guys know how you get on. I'd be really interested, I'd be really interested <laughs> yeah, we'll to pass hear. It on. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, Rory. Where can people find yourself online? And I'll put all the uh, market your music, make your transition stuff in the show notes. Okay. Uh, so I would say the best bit is to um, check out Make a Transition on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, if you want like free marketing kind of tips um, and also kind of music production tips from Paul Nolan, who is an absolute gold mine of knowledge yeah, in wizard. that. Oh, no, yeah, a, a little ginger wizard that he is. Um, <laughs> Yeah, head over to Make a Transition on Facebook. Uh, give us a follow there. Um, and then you get loads of really good free shit. Um, and yeah, let us know what works for you. Mm. Um, that's the other interesting thing. What works for some clients doesn't work for others. So I think any kind of live feedback would be ace. Um, yeah, I'll be on DMs there, so you can hit me up there. As I said before, I am on Facebook and stuff, so you can kind of find me, but I might not reply to you. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm trying to wean myself off it. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, Rory. Thanks for being part of the Thank podcast. you very much. Thank it's very been much. amazing. And I look forward to everything with the future of Rory Palmer Row and Make a Transition. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rory. That concludes episode number nine of Your Music Industry. I'd personally like to thank you for listening and taking time out of your day to listen to our podcast. We always have our ears open, so if you have any feedback or guests you'd like to see on the podcast, make sure to let me know. Email me at daniel at liverpoolaudio.net and I look forward to hearing from you. Just a quick question before we end. Are you a music producer? Make sure you use our special code that enables you one free month of Splice Sounds. That's a million samples that you can have access to to use in your tracks. Use code Liverpool Audio to gain access to this platform. And until episode number 10, I hope you have a superb week. <laughs>